In this week's video, we're gonna be discussing the best settings and choices for your interior and architecture photography. Let's do this. Okay, for those of you who don't know me, my name is James Kerwin. I'm an architecture and interior photographer, English guy, obviously. Uh, I'm based in Tbilisi, Georgia, currently seeing out the pandemic. Um, I've actually been nomadic on the road since January of 2014, and I like shooting abandoned relics, ruins, disused architecture, uh, ghost towns, and off the beaten path locations. But I also do stock video and photos as well. Um, if you'd like to see my stuff and want to check out more, there's a website link in the description below. Okay, so today we're going to be discussing settings and choices for interior and architecture photography. Um, what I mean is like steps to get the best possible chance of getting great results on location. Um, these are steps that you can do every time when you're setting up for a new shot, uh, you know, a new setting. Uh, and you can go through this process and you can basically tick these things off to make sure you're thinking about each step along the way. The first one is getting your composition set. Of course, that uh, goes without saying, but what most people do is they grab their tripod, they put their camera on it. And yes, most architecture and interior photos are done on a tripod. But what they do is they get their camera, they put it on the tripod, they run around the location and they move their tripod from pillar to post. And I don't think that's the best way to do it. I think what you should do is take your camera off the tripod, walk around freehand, you know, hold the camera in your hand and look for compositions. Once you've got something you like the look of, then pull your tripod into position, position those legs, you know, that can get a bit awkward, get them in position, move it around, and then get your composition locked down on your tripod. So yeah, first tip is to think about your composition and think about your end result, um, which I'll briefly talk about. So what I mean here is, when you're going in, you've got to think about what you want your final shot to look like, and doing this compositional technique can really help with that. Okay, the next one I've actually got an example of, um, white balance. Um, and people say, well, you shoot in raw, it doesn't really matter. Well, actually, yeah, you can change your white balance in raw, in, if you're shooting in raw, in post-processing, of course. But the thing is, sometimes I find examples actually where the setting of the white balance is better set in camera because it helps you achieve the final result. And what I mean by that is sometimes um, the, the bright or the lights and the cone to color tones really put off what you're seeing in the back of the camera. Um, you know, that kind of tiny screen. For instance, I've got an example here in Lightroom um, that I shot fairly recently where the dome that I was in, the underwater reservoir, was filled with orange. So I had to go back the next day and retake the shot. Let's take a look at it. So here we are in Lightroom, and this is the underwater reservoir. And your first thought might be, wow, look at the reflections, the tones, look at the light beams, the ladder. Look at the light beams. Mm, yeah, I didn't like them so much after a while. The thing is, because of how much light was coming into the scene, I had my camera white balance on auto white balance. And for me, that then makes this scene very orange. Because the light was then shining in, reflecting off the water, and pushing it back towards the ceiling and that nice roof which in turn then made it an orange glow. For me, industry looks better when you've got more of like purple tones, especially in the shadows. Purple or blue tones in the shadows gives the impression that it's kind of moody, but also that it's a, a dark industrial place as well. It sort of suits the subject very well. I think having orange in the scene kind of contradicts that. So I went back the next day and reshot the photo. So the next day I pushed my white balance down to shade on the back setting, which changed it to a very much more of a blue tone and that's just by setting a different preset in camera under white balance. You could also do Kelvin, which would dial in your own temperature and then check it each time just to check the results. But for me here, it was too dark to do that and I knew that shade would be more blue. Uh, but I also went to the location once the sun had disappeared from the sky. I knew that at uh, about 3 p.m. there would no longer be light beams because basically the sun would drift away behind the location. Then, because the sun's gone, obviously we've then got no light beams. We've eliminated the light beams, meaning we're not reflecting so much of that orange, only patches rather than the whole scene being changed. I'll flip between the two now, but you'll see my composition is a little bit different. I also improved it, I think, by angling up a little bit more. But overall, the orange tones being vacant from this image, the second one, I think really improves it. 
That also brings me back to point number one, thinking about your final result. Here I didn't do that, it was a darker location like I said, difficult to kind of line up a composition first hand hold. Uh, I had to kind of rely on a longer exposure and then fine tuning my composition. Going home for an evening, thinking about it and going back the next day also allowed me to do that. Next one is to choose your shoot mode. Um, so of course uh, you've got loads of shoot modes within your camera. Um, I wouldn't recommend shutter priority for architecture and interior photography on the basis that really it's meant for moving subjects, animals, sports, things like this. So I would say you want to be heading towards aperture priority or even better manual. Aperture priority allows you to fix the aperture down, choosing how much you want in focus, how much depth of field you're getting in your scene. Um, manual does a similar thing, but the thing is with manual is if you use it in architecture photography combined with the live view on the back of the camera, what you actually then see is you can see yourself improving because you get a better understanding of what's happening. In a Canon camera, for instance, as you move the shutter speed and dial it down, say you set your camera at f8, ISO at 100, and then you move your shutter speed, what happens is, is the camera gets lighter and darker on the back of the LCD, training you what settings are best for this particular shot. So it's a real quick way of learning manual settings, especially when you're on live view. So I would recommend using aperture or manual. Um, like I said, um, aperture allows you to fix in the aperture that you're looking for. And I always recommend the sharpest point for your lens. So it could be f7.1, f8, f9, and it depends on what lens and camera setup, of course, you have. Okay, so the next setting we're gonna be talk talking about really is aperture choice. And what I mean here is, is, say for example, you're taking a detail shot, a banister, a railing, some decay, or a chair in the corner that really looks you know, really nice and you wanna get a nice photo of it. Well, in that case, you may want a lower aperture, something like f2.8, 4.5, and that'll blur out some of the background, create some sort of bokeh. However, you might also want to get everything in focus, everything nice and sharp in the scene, like I do with some of my wider shots. And what I mean there is you might want to get your camera set up and locking an aperture of like f8, get most of it in focus. But what happens it then if there's a railing or a banister in the front of your scene or a staircase and you want to highlight that as well? It might be that you even need to do things like focus stacking, which means you need to focus on uh, the element at the front of the scene the banister, and then something at the back of the room. And what you'd then do is you'd get them blended together in post-processing items like Photoshop uh, to stitch them together to get an increased depth of field. Um, and you may say, well, why can't I just focus on the banister? Well, everything behind that, because of the distance involved, depending on how near it is the camera, some of the background may well then be out of focus. So I recommend having this choice in mind. Do I want a focus stack? What aperture do I need? An aperture choice is definitely the next point that you need to consider. Uh, it's an easy technique to do, and a little side tip for you. If you're in the field and you do focus stack, take two shots, make sure you take a photo of your thumb or your hand afterwards. Uh, so that when you're looking for your photos on Lightroom at a later date, you know that you've done some focus stacking. Okay, so you've got your composition set, you've got your white balance locked down, you've got your aperture and your shoot mode selected. So what next? Well, we need to choose whether or not we need to bracket our scene. And that's um, sometimes easier said than done. I mean, you might walk in and it looks perfectly fine, but once you've got it on the back of the camera, it's a bit dark. Things look a bit dark and gloomy. In which case, in most cases, you might wanna just bracket your shots. I recommend doing this with the in-camera mode so it's automatic. And usually you can set your brackets to be one, two, three stops apart, and depending on your camera, maybe even more. You can also choose to have three, five, or more brackets, depending on your camera brand. But I've very rarely come across a scene where you need seven or nine or even more brackets in a scene. It's quite rare. In fact, it happens outside probably more than interiors. I would also use the camera's dynamic range to fill the gap. So say, for example, um, you shoot a scene, it's got three brackets that are two stops apart. Well, everything in between that should be covered by the camera's dynamic range. You can always increase and decrease highlights and shadows to basically fill the gaps. That's what I'm trying to say to you here. But if in doubt, capture five or seven and worry about it afterwards. You can look through them in Lightroom. It's digital after all. One of the tips I've got to know whether or not you need to do exposure blends um, and you need to bracket your photos is to check your histogram. 
are any of the blacks in your first shot crushed to the left on your histogram, in which case your shadows are underexposed. You've got pure blacks that are getting crushed. Maybe on your histogram it's showing lots more white, it's shoving the histogram to the right hand side. And if it's crushed to the right, that means that you've got burnt out highlights, things like windows could be a problem here. What you tend to do is try and get things close to the middle as possible, and if not, maybe closer to the left hand side, depending on your shoot style. And if you've got stuff that's crushed on either side, that's perhaps when you need to look at bracketing your shots. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna be discussing is ISO. And what I mean here is, is what is your shutter speed currently? And we do this last because then it'll tell you how long your shutter speed is. Um, is it too long? Um, this affects, obviously, if you're doing five brackets, thinking about the last point, and your ISO is really low, it could be that some of your bracketing is gonna take minutes. And that means that if you're in the preset modes, you need to be in bold mode and you can't actually shoot. What you'll see is it'll flash 30. Most cameras can only do 30 seconds. What you can do though is increase the ISO to bring some of them shutter speeds down. Perhaps you're in a rush and you need to get away from that location. Perhaps you've got a huge hotel to shoot and you've only got two hours because that's what the client has told you. Well, in which case, you probably wanna to look to increase your ISO. Bumping up to 200 from 100 ISO in modern cameras, it's very rare that it will actually decrease your quality, especially if you're exposure blending like the previous point and bracket in your shots. I sometimes even increase my ISO as high as 400 in my camera. I've got a Canon 5DSR. If things are dark, 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 you can then just speed yourself up, speed up your process. I don't recommend speeding yourself up, but of course, in some instances, we need to get a move on. Okay, so you've gone through all of the other choices. Now what? Well, we need to consider motion. And I said about this with ISO, motion is important. And it seems daft if you're indoors, right? But what I mean is what happens if you've got an overgrown location or you've got, say, a hospital foyer that you're shooting and there's doctors and nurses running past or you're shooting a bar and there's staff? Well, motion is something you've got to consider. Um, you might want to slow the motion or you might want to fix the motion. And there's different choices and each, uh, nothing is right or wrong, it's really a personal choice of view. Obviously, adding motion into your photos can really give it a, dr a dramatic effect, really. It can really make a wow factor and make your image stand out from the crowd. So, if you're indoors and you want to show that motion, perhaps you need to get a shutter speed that's somewhere around about half a second, quarter of a second. Say you want to get those people walking through the foyer of the hospital. That might mean you need to do an ISO boost and then capture a shot that's individual to your, to your other brackets and then layer that in Photoshop later and blend in the part of the image that you want. So basically, you capture your five brackets and then you think about your motion. You add in your shot with your people, or in my case, it could be that I shoot another bracket to get all of my trees or grass that's overgrown in my scene. Say I'm shooting an, an abandoned church and there's loads of grass in there and there's a windy day and it's breeze is blowing through. I might wanna get another shot with an ISO boost just to get those, uh, you know, all those leaves and all of those parts of the uh, scene nice and still. And then what I'll do is I'll blend that together in post and that then makes my trees not look so blurry and nasty because uh, there is a difference between creative motion blur and then having motion blur that's basically done by accident. So what I'm trying to say there is get an extra bracket thinking about motion blur after you've done each of the other steps that we've just discussed. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed this content. Uh, if you have, consider subscribing. Hit the bell notification and you'll be alerted every time I upload new content. Uh, if you've got any questions, is there, if there's anything I've missed at all, then please leave them in the comments section below and I'll ensure to come back to you. Until next time, if you found this video useful, maybe share it with a friend and of course, tickle the like button for us. Until next time, Bye-bye for now.